Another grim milestone as global COVID-19 cases pass 400 million. Hello, I'm Mike Walter filling in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. The coronavirus pandemic is entering its third year with a death toll topping 5.7 million people worldwide. The Omicron variant continues to surge in many regions, and now there are fears of yet another deadly strain. But nations are learning to live with the virus as governments lift restrictions, open borders, and ramp up vaccination efforts. Earlier, I spoke with the World Health Organization spokesperson, Dr. Margaret Harris, about these issues. Let's watch. Dr. Harris, uh, all too often when we talk about the pandemic, we talk numbers, and so I'll throw some in your direction and, and get your thoughts on it. Globally, there are about 400 million cases uh, last month. It was about 300 million. We look at the death toll, it jumped uh, from, to 5.7 million. Uh, the World Health Organization reporting 500,000 more deaths since the onset of Omicron. Read into these numbers. W what is it telling us? It's telling us we're still in the midst of a really severe pandemic with a, a virus that is still able to kill far too many of us, especially those who are most susceptible. That's older people, that's people with underlying conditions, and also it's people who've not yet been able to be vaccinated. And you're fighting an enemy that's ever-changing. I mean, we keep talking about variants. We talked about Delta and Omicron. Talk to us as you look forward. Obviously, that's got to be a concern. You know, what type of variants are we going to see? So talk to us about the landscape, what you're witnessing right now, and fears. So certainly what we're witnessing now is that in many regions, there's been a huge wave of Omicron. Omicron's been far more transmissible than any version of, of COVID we've seen before. And many uh, virologists are, now, are also saying it's the most transmissible virus they've ever seen. Uh, so we've seen these huge waves. Many of the regions are now coming down rapidly. We're seeing that in Europe. We're seeing that in the Americas. But other regions are going up. We're seeing that in, for instance, the, the Gulf states. Uh, Sadly, also, we are seeing a lot of deaths. And one of the concerns we have is that somehow the a narrative that Omicron is somehow less of a threat has taken hold. And this is not the case. The big difference now is that we do have many populations that have got high vaccination rates. And fortunately, they have been able to weather the storm. But we need to get the whole world vaccinated in order to enable the whole world to weather the storm that we are very much in. Talk to me about the fears, though, because it seems like uh, you're fighting Delta and then all of a sudden, you're, oh, hey, we're making some headway with Delta, but then there's Omicron. And now there's a B, uh, what is it, BA2, and you know, there could be a BA3, 4, 5, 7. Um, what about the fears as you continue to, to fight this thing? Because it keeps changing uh, in, in so many different ways. Yes, indeed. This this coronavirus has shown us that it can change itself and change itself quite dramatically. Now, we saw mutations from the beginning. And, and in the early days, these mutations did not necessarily create um, an advantage for the virus. But later on down the track, and you've mentioned some of them, Delta, we've had Alpha, we've had Beta as well. They did have advantages. They increased the ability to transmit. And, and with Delta, we saw also many people with very severe disease. And when Omicron came along, that's exactly why we warned the world. And much of our work now is to very much track all the mutations, and there are so many of them. And most of them don't cause necessarily a problem. But we have a very large worldwide group of experts tracking all of them to ensure that when one emerges, like Omicron, that's going to cause a threat, we can inform the world very early and advise what has to happen. So the critical thing is that countries don't sort of say, oh, well, we're fine now because we're vaccinated. Keep on tracking, doing the genetic sequencing, doing the testing so that we can pick the next one early. And as you mentioned, uh, these are waves. Uh, one country or one region may be doing better. All of a sudden, you see it popping up in the Gulf states, and this is kind of it's 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 what you've been witnessing throughout. One of the other things you've been witnessing throughout is vaccine equity. Uh, you know, some countries uh, you've got people who are getting a fourth shot. 
Other countries, you have people who are just waiting to get a jab for the first time. And this also creates major problems. Where are we on that? So I have to say it's improving. It's It certainly has been for the entire year of 2021. I think that was the year when the world really let itself down in terms of neighborliness or in terms of equity. You know, the, the countries with the greatest resources ran for the lifeboats and bought up so many of the lifeboats that some of them were left to rot, you know, while other countries, other people couldn't get anything. Um, now, that has improved. In the last quarter of 2021, we were able to deliver more vaccines than we had been through our COVAX facility than we had for the rest of the year. And in fact, during our last allocation, we had uh, we were in the wonderful position of having more supply, uh, enough supply or more supply to meet everybody's demands. And we hope that will continue. On the boosters, there are, with Omicron, there are there is science that indicates that the third booster is appropriate, especially for the people at high risk. What, again, we want countries to do is not buy up, hoard huge amounts of vaccine so that nobody else can get it. And at the moment, we're, we're not seeing hoarding. So that is a good thing. Uh, Dr. Harris, we're also seeing many countries saying, you know, uh, we're done. We're, we're through with this. Uh, we're going to lift the lockdowns, the mass mandates, uh, and that sort of thing. And we've also seen in the past, I remember uh, President Biden's speech about, hey, we can all get together 4th of July. Nobody knew Delta was coming. Um, there's always been this tendency among politicians and leaders like, look, let's, let's just kind of relax things. There has to be fear on your part about this. Are they getting too early a start on this? Well, what are your thoughts? So quite often with leaders, they want to give their population hope. They want to, to give them something to look forward to. Unfortunately, uh, there is hope, but the hope is that we work together and really work to get the virus down. So the problem is when people, when when leaders say, "Oh, it's all over," people think that it suddenly disappeared, which is not the case and was never the case, has never been the case throughout the pandemic. So with Omicron, it's very, very much raging through the world, and. For we at the World Health Organization, we really want everybody around the world to be their own risk manager. Look at what's going on, understand what's going on in your society, and take all the precautions that protect you, like the mask wearing, like the physical distancing, also like looking at the ventilation in your space, looking at how you can live differently to protect yourself, not just from this one, but from the next respiratory virus. We all have to live a much better, safer, healthier life. It's interesting, too, now, uh, for so long we've heard the word pandemic, now we're hearing the word endemic. And it's interesting, Michael Ryan at the WHO said recently, endemic in itself does not mean good. Endemic means it's just here forever. Can you talk to us about this distinction? Because I think a lot of people think, oh, endemic, that's, that's so much better. Uh, it's not necessarily the case, though, is it? That's absolutely right. And I would really underscore what Mike Ryan said. Um, we have a lot of diseases that are endemic. Malaria is one. Malaria kills millions of people every year. Uh, tuberculosis, also endemic, kills millions of people every year. You don't want a disease to be constantly being a threat. Um, so we want to bring it down to as low levels as possible. We probably can never get it out of the human population, but we don't want it to become a malaria or other such thing. Indeed, endemic does not equal good. Let me ask you one final question. Hans Kluger, uh, the World Health Organization's regional director for Europe, recently talked about, you know, how do we approach this pandemic? What do we do? Let's listen to what he had to say. In fact, the strategy shifts from minimizing transmission to minimizing disruption because of the very fast spread of the Omicron variant. The key point is to shield the vulnerable. What do you make of what he had to say? So Dr. Kluger, Kluger was very much talking about the European situation. And, and that's a really important point, that every country needs to look at their current epidemiology and also, indeed, look at what they can do to keep societies going while preventing transmission and while bringing the transmission down and 
protecting the vulnerable. And those are the people most likely to be severely ill. It's also those people who have not yet had a chance to get vaccinated. So you protect the vulnerable by finding the people who have not had a chance to be vaccinated. And it may be because they have beliefs that have blocked them from getting vaccinated. It may also be that they have not had, uh, it's geographically difficult. They haven't had the physical means of getting vaccinated. So there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that everyone who could have the worst outcomes from this disease is protected from it. Dr. Harris, one final question before we let you go. Um, what is going to be the legacy of, of COVID? I mean, it's just a tsunami of, of misery when we look at it. Uh, there's still long COVID. We're probably going to be studying this for some time to come. What's your assessment? So you've mentioned the bad side. There is a good side as well. Science has just galloped ahead. We are light years ahead in many of our technologies. Our, our ability to understand at micro level what a virus is doing, you know, our genetic sequencing, the fact that we're talking about things like BA2 as if this is normal. Genetic sequencing is a relatively recent tool and yet it's become everyday language. Um, the ability to develop vaccines and then tweak vaccines again in real time, track what a virus is doing, tweak the vaccines. So as, a, as humanity, the best of humanity has come out with our great collaboration, our great solidarity with science. The other things, the legacy, I hope, is that we really change how we live. We look at live, not crowding ourselves together. We look at providing quality um, housing with good ventilation, good ventilation in our offices, in our schools, really, really change the way we live because we owe it to ourselves as the human race to not give the viruses a chance to jump. And lastly, Let's look at our environment, at, at, at the effects of climate change and how we are encroaching on the animal kingdom, on the, on, on the ch damaging the environment in such a way that viruses are jumping ever more often from the animal kingdom into the human um, population. So there is a lot that of good this very negative experience could yield for the future. Dr. Margaret Harris there. One of the biggest global stories playing out right now is the protest by Canadian truckers against vaccine mandates for cross-border travel. Over the past couple of weeks, the Freedom Convoy, as it is called, has snarled traffic in several Canadian cities. On Tuesdays, protesters used their big rigs to block travel across the Ambassador Bridge, effectively shutting down one of the busiest international border crossings in North America. CGTN's Dan Williams is in Ottawa with the latest. It would appear there is no end in sight to this so-called Freedom Convoy. There is a uh, significant amount of support that you can now see around the various uh, truckers and uh, others that have come here to make their voices heard. We've been seeing uh, people cooking, uh, bringing food, uh, bringing fuel supplies as well for the truckers, this support network in order to ensure that this uh, protest continues. Now, uh, here, the whole of the downtown area in Ottawa remains uh, completely gridlocked and uh, certainly for most of the truck drivers that I've spoken to uh, it would appear that uh, as far as they're concerned they are here for the long haul. Freedom, freedom of all mandates and that's what we're fighting for. We're Canadian and we want to be free Canadians. And it's not just here in Ottawa where these protests have taken place. At the Ambassador Bridge, one of the key crossing points between the US and Canada, we're seeing uh, similar blockades uh, taking place there as well. That uh, began on Monday. It was cleared for a short while, uh, but appears to be now uh, blocked uh, once again. And we're seeing similar kinds of protests as well in other locations, the likes of in France, in Australia, New Zealand uh, as well. And so uh, there will be a number of uh, governments around the world well, watching what happens here, what, watching very closely as to seeing whether that uh, the, potentially what's happening here uh, could come to their front door as well. Uh, and of course, the question here, though, in Canada is how does this end uh, seemingly with so much to, uh, a difference of opinion between what the truck drivers uh, are calling for and what uh, the government here uh, are looking to mandate. Uh, so certainly uh, seemingly no end in sight to this protest here in Ottawa. Sam Williams, CGTN, Ottawa, Canada.
To discuss this and more, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from San Francisco, California is Dr. Monica Gandhi. She is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Out of St. Louis, Missouri, Dr. Zayed Al Ali is the director of the Clinical Epidemiology Center and the chief of research and education service at the Veterans Affairs St. Louis Healthcare System. And in Ottawa, Canada is Andrew Cohen. He is a journalist and associate professor of journalism and communication at Carleton University. I want to welcome all of you to the show. And Andrew, I want to start with you. This Freedom Convoy obviously getting a lot of press. How's it being viewed there in Canada? And, you know, Dan asks a really interesting question. How does this end? Um, it's been viewed, if you believe public polls, it's been viewed negatively. Uh, about two-thirds of Canadians do not share the aspirations of the, the truckers, but perhaps 30 or 35 percent might. Uh, this is took some people considered a hostage taking. They have uh, driven big trucks downtown. They've immobilized them by removing their wheels. There are some reports, but they're unconfirmed, that there may be arms or explosive in these trucks. They're unconfirmed. And they have shut down, not so much the downtown, all of it, but or certainly not the city, but the parliamentary precinct, the roads around the Parliament of Canada, which is meeting now. And so, Many people think that uh, there is no way out of this short of the government forcing them out because they are demanding the government resign, which is not going to happen. And they are demanding the government reverse vaccine mandates and other mandates, which the Canadian people have embraced. Canada has, incidentally, among the highest levels of vaccination uh, among Western industrialized con uh, countries. So the truckers, uh, some of them are said to be American, funded by American, with allegedly um, a number of people from the alt-right involved in it, certainly gaining a great deal of support in the United States. Tucker Carlson, President uh, Trump, uh, Elon Musk have all said nice things about, about them. Uh, the, the government of Canada worries there's something more here, that it's not just about vaccinations, but it's a threat to the legitimacy of the government of Canada. And that is what is occupying most people now, because there doesn't seem to be, short of forcing them out and having the police presence to do that, there doesn't seem to be an imminent end to this after 12 days. And Zayed, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and other lawmakers, as we just heard, under attack for how they're handling the pandemic. And, and you're hearing from these truckers, they're, they're looking at some of these European countries, which are easing restrictions and saying, hey, we want that too. Um, from a scientific viewpoint, uh, from your view, how do you view all of this? I think it's really too early and too soon to really relieve or lift the restrictions. We, we still know that Omicron is, is, is here. Omicron is very highly transmissible. And we know that vaccines are effective, but they're not 100% effective. And we know that a good portion of the population you know, here and also in Canada are not vaccinated yet. So that's all boats for you know, increased transmissibility, increased infections. And although you know, generally Omicron may be a bit milder than prior variant, it still can put people in hospitals and it can still lead to death. And you can look at the statistics and, and, and see really the, the huge number of people that died from Omicron over the past several weeks. So we really think that, that this is really too early and too soon to sort of lift restrictions and, and to protect the public and to protect everyone, including the vulnerable, immunosuppressed people and people with disabilities and people with chronic disease that have a very, very high risk of catching disease. You know, it, it's a, we feel it's a collective social responsibility to maintain some level of public health measures to, to, to continue to suppress that transmission and suppress spread of Omicron. And Monica, uh, as Andrew pointed out, Dan as well, uh, these truckers have made it very clear. They, they want the mask mandates gone. They want a easing of lockdowns, these gathering restrictions basically erased. Um, you wrote a piece in, in Time recently saying, you know, this back and forth is not healthy. We need to have a new strategy. What would that strategy look like? Yes, I think that new strategy should look like a hospitalization and vaccination rate in a region determining the easing of restrictions because the World Health Organization has to look out for the whole world. Um, Canada has to look out for all of Canada. And here in the U.S., it's almost like we have 50 different countries. We have very high vaccination rates uh, in California, New York, New Jersey, multiple other places, and we have much lower vaccination rates in other places in the south and southeast of our country. And because of that, I think putting together those two metrics, vaccination rates and hospitalization metrics, which we argued for even in an April piece in the Washington Post, 
to when you ease restrictions is the right approach. The problem with using case rates is that case rates vary all over the place, meaning um, some places test more than others. For example, uh, there are many places, India and Africa, that, that um, don't test as much as we do here in the United States or Canada. And the other reason is rapid antigen tests are not recorded often in health departments. So I would go on a hospitalization and vaccination rate, make it clean, make it objective, and then release restrictions like masks. Andrew, these uh, protests not just popping up in, in Canada. We're seeing them in uh, New Zealand, Australia, France. Uh, we're seeing these tensions growing here in the United States in the state of Virginia. We, we saw the governor in a store the other day. He didn't have a mask on. One of the customers challenged him and said, you know, read the room. All of the customers had masks on. You, you're seeing these different sides really digging in their heels. Um, as a journalist, uh, what should journalists be focused on right now? Because it seems like... Uh, you know, one of the things you're saying is that perhaps the people in Canada may not support these truckers. They're certainly getting a lot of oxygen, as you said in the press. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, our job is to report. Our job is also to report accurately and prudently and with a measured uh, view. Uh, these are folks in Canada, in Ottawa. They have shut down the parliamentary precinct. That gives them publicity. Publicity for them is their oxygen. That is what sustains them. For a week, the Ottawa police, which have been overwhelmed, said this would de-escalate. It isn't de-escalating. It's not that there's been violence. There has not been violence, not any material violence or destruction. They are simply here, and they're preventing some 30,000 people in downtown Ottawa from going about their business, going to shops and restaurants and, and stores. They've, they've closed clinics and, and libraries. And they've also, up to about a day ago, were blaring their horns all night, which is a form of intimidation. There are elements of this crowd, um, which are anti-Muslim, which are racist. You see, we've seen swastikas. By and large, the truckers are uh, part of a, an industry where 90% are vaccinated. So if you're asking how we should cover this, we should be reminding people watching it that simply because there was a loud, uh, noisy, powerful minority doesn't mean Canada, A, will yield to them, um, and, and B, uh, doesn't mean they have traction in public opinion, because by and large, they don't. It doesn't mean there's no sympathy for people who've lost their jobs because they didn't want to get vaccinated. But by and large, these issues were settled in Canada. And probably as the pandemic eases, it will, it will be less contentious. That having been said, this crowd is not going anywhere, and it will be up to the government to decide how they get rid of them. So I had uh, talking about uh, the pandemic easing, uh, there more than 900,000 people have lost their lives here in the United States. It's just a staggering number when you consider uh, the virus has only been with us really in a relatively short period of time. Dr. Fauci believes the full blown pandemic phase is coming to an end. So describe for us what this new phase looks like, because when people hear that, they think, oh, it's over. Uh, I can take the mask off. I can go out and do live my life like I did before. Um, that's not necessarily the case, is it? It's absolutely not necessarily the case. I mean, we, we should disagree with, with, with Tony Fauci on this. Uh, they didn't anticipate Omicron. You know, they didn't anticipate Delta. They didn't anticipate Omicron. So, uh, and what we know about viruses is that viruses mutate. So down the road, there are likely to be another variant. And what we also know about vaccines is the vaccines themselves protect people, but do not protect people 100 percent, 100 percent, and our people are having, you know, breakthrough infections. So collectively, we think that the that we're really not out of the woods yet. We're definitely, you know, not anywhere near the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and uh, we think that that in continuing the emphasis on increasing vaccination rates and increasing boosting and trying to make sure people that are sort of used to some form of public health measure, used to some form of a, a, a masking, would, we, we think would be important to try to you know, achieve a most optimal reduction in, in, in harm and hospitalization and, and death of people. Monica, uh, not out of the woods yet, he just said, and yet we're looking at states uh, such as Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, Oregon, Illinois, Rhode Island, and California, all moving away from mask mandates. Are, are they jumping the gun? Well, so I think that they would be jumping the gun if we go on cases, which is actually what the CDC goes on. They go on transmission rates and cases. The problem with that is that cases, again, didn't mean what they used to mean in the past. What used to happen is cases and hospitalizations would track with each other. It was tremendously important to keep cases down. 
now with more of our, we've been lucky that we have access to the vaccines, more of our population getting vaccinated, cases and hospitalizations are not linking with each other like they are. They're decoupled in places of high vaccination. And so that's why I again go back to hospitalization and vaccination rates. So for example, I looked this morning to, and why did we even do any of these public health measures? Lockdowns, masks, ventilation, distancing, capacity limits. We did it to keep our hospital capacity within range. We had to keep the hospitals low. That is always a principle of public health. We had to work on keeping our hospitalizations flatter. Vaccination is the best way to, to keep severe disease at bay, though I agree with the, that, that um, mild disease is still happening because of the antibodies going down but our severe disease rates are lower because of vaccinations. So going back to lifting of metrics, if I look at California, which I am, and the governor lifted mass mandates yesterday, we have high vaccination rates and we have within the parameters of low hospitalization rates, about 10 over 100,000 for COVID. So we are well within range of vaccination hospitalization to lift our restrictions. Andrew, uh, I asked Dr. Uh, Margaret Harris about, you know, the legacy of, of this pandemic, and she talked about some of the lessons learned. You know, perhaps we, we look at climate change a little closer. We look at encroaching on the animal kingdom. Do you think those are the lessons that we're getting from this? Well, what do you think the lessons, the takeaways are from this pandemic? Um, that, that we're vulnerable, that our lives will not be the same as they were before, that um, given the nature of international travel, uh, these... Uh, variants, these these um, diseases travel with an ease they did not before. Uh, we've also learned, and science has helped us in this, how to respond. Uh, I sit in a country which had no vaccine-making capacity, which will now have it. We've learned of what we need in the future. I think that we will change the way we live, we'll change the way we work, we'll change the way we travel, but we will still get back to some kind of accommodation uh, with COVID-19 and whatever comes with it. Uh, Canada is not as advanced in lowering its guard as other nations are, but I expect we'll get there because we'll have to. One of the reasons there is the frustration in, our, in this country, in this city today, is because this thing has gone on two years and everybody, everybody is frustrated and has a level of anxiety and strain. Yeah. Um, so next time, um, we'll know more with technology, yeah. the, the technology I'm talking to you on tonight, uh, Mike, did... I knew nothing about it yeah. before, well, before COVID, we've and all, now I do. We've all had to change in that regard. Uh, thank you all. I really appreciate the conversation, and we need to leave it there. I'm Mike Walter, Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for watching another edition of The Heat.